start a new series today called The Real Jesus. This weekend, a Christian movie came out, and it's amazing what you hear on Facebook, read on Facebook. Some are against it, some are for it. It's not a biblical interpretation of Scripture. It is a representation of the life of Jesus, and I haven't seen the movie yet. But anything that gets people talking about Jesus is something that we can use to show them the real Jesus. I was watching the news last night and on NBC News, and a, and a thing came up, 2014, the year of the Bible. Because of a, a number of Christian movies that are coming out, Noah and the Son of God. Whatever it takes for people to hear about Jesus, we need to take it and use it. Not bash it, but to use it because people are talking about Jesus. We live in a world, in a country today that is biblically illiterate and no longer know who Jesus is. There are so many distorted views of Jesus and what people think of Jesus. Watch this video this morning. Who do you say Jesus was? I have no idea. Who was Jesus? Gosh, I have to start with I'm not sure. Who was Jesus to you? Some guy. Actually, I don't believe in Jesus. Not really sure exactly who Jesus was. I think Jesus was uh, was a was kind of a cool guy back in his day. Who was Jesus to you? <laughs> I think I'm done. I don't like to talk about it. I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious. Who do you think Jesus was or is? Uh, Jesus was a historical figure. I believe that Jesus Christ was a man who had an extraordinary ability to link in with the creator. I think he was uh, definitely someone that people, you know, a good role model. I, I do think he had a lot of great ideas. More or less, he was just a prophet, which is just a messenger of God. Sort of a revolutionary in his day. Jesus was an amazing man. I don't believe he's God's son. I just believe he's a person. As to his, like, God-like quality, I'm not totally sold on that. You think he was a prophet? That would, see, I'd have to be Christian to really believe that. Jesus was the Messiah for some people, and for some people he wasn't. I'm not necessarily sure if Jesus was the Messiah or a prophet, but in either case, he was somebody that spoke the word of God. He was equal portions of, of human and, uh, and that energy that is God. People said he was sent by God. Well, no one, God doesn't send him down. You don't go on up. <laughs> I mean, you... He linked in. I mean, I do believe in Jesus in the sense of like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. That I'm, I'm not saying that he, he didn't exist or anything of the sort, but the fact that, um, I mean, I necessarily don't go and uh, pray to Jesus. Who was Jesus? Uh, Jesus is some God. Jesus was the son of God. I believe Jesus is the son of God who came to save us all from our sins. Jesus was a savior. Who died for our sins and cleaned us, made us pure enough to enter God's glory. The, um, only way you can get to heaven. Who do you think Jesus is? Um, who do I think he is? I, I don't think it's who he was. I think he still is Jesus, so he's not gone or anything, you know. I guess in body technically he is, but he's still here. The Jesus story sort of borders on history and myth for me, um, but I don't believe that it could have permeated our culture so fully and for so long if there was nothing to that. The question we need to ask is not do we believe in Jesus, but who is Jesus? There's a world of difference between those two questions. And I want to look at that over the next number of weeks of who is Jesus? Because we're, we're in a generation today that doesn't know who Jesus is. You look at some of those comments, I mean, that's a scary thing, that the generation doesn't know who Jesus is. 
And we need to have an answer to give to people so they know that we know who we're talking about. How can I talk about someone that I don't know? What is our view of Jesus? Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Beginning at verse 15, a prayer that prayed, Paul prayed over the Ephesian Christians. And he prayed this prayer beginning in verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the Spirit, the capital S, the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation. For what reason? So that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And his incomparably great power for us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in everything every way. He is not one of many ways to God. He is the only way to God. He is the rock. He, Peter is not the rock, but Jesus is the rock that the church is built upon. And we need an understanding to know him better, not just to know about him, not just to know facts about him, not just to know the stories about him, but to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. How many remember the old TV show, To Tell the Truth? If you are, you're dating yourself. How many never heard of the TV show, To Tell the Truth? That, that may explain. Wow. Either you're young or you didn't have a TV. I don't know. But To Tell the Truth was an old show, and they would have three people come out, and there would be a panel of four people, and they would come out and say, Hi, my name is Ron Squibb. The next guy would come out, Hello, my name is Ron Squibb. The next guy would come out, Hello, my name is Ron Squibb. And then they would sit down, and the, and the panel would ask them questions. Well, uh, uh, tell me about yourself. Where were you born? What, what kind of job did you do? They, they would ask them a lot of questions. And, and at the end of the, of the half hour, and they would ask all these questions, and they would say, now will the real Ron Squibb stand up? And so all three, they would begin to get up. They begin to sit down, and hey, you never know. And then finally, the real Ron Squibb would stand up. I pray that the real Jesus Christ would stand up and that America would know who Jesus is because sadly too many people have a distorted or an unbiblical view of who Jesus Christ is. We see these words about Jesus and we know about Jesus, but do we know him personally? See, Christianity is not following a religion as some of them said on the video. It's not following a doctrine. You know, I'm, not, I, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> and then we have people who are not religious, but they're spiritual, and people that are spiritual that are not religious. And, and today it's so black, and there's no black and white. It's all gray and mixed in. And, but how do we see Jesus? says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 20 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and preach in your name and sing in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name and whatever else we do in his name? And I'll tell you plainly, I never knew you away from me you evil doers. See, Jesus is teaching us the purpose. And, and I believe that one day when we get to heaven, 
There's going to be people that we never thought were going to be there that are going to be there. People that we say, man, they didn't have their act together. There was things messed up. But if they accept Jesus Christ on their deathbed, let me tell you, they're going to be in the pearly gates of heaven. They're going to be walking the streets of glory just like anybody else. And I believe that there are going to be other people who have sat in churches, who have done a lot of good deeds, have gone good things, but they never knew Jesus Christ personally. And he'll say, depart from me for I never knew you. Friends, we need to get down to the reality that Jesus came for a purpose. He came to bring us into a relationship with him. And he's saying that there are people who do things on the surface or on the external and they can dress the right way and, and they can say the right words and they can sing the songs and they can take communion and they can do all the, the religious activity. But if it's not a relationship with Jesus Christ, then something is missing and we need to know who the Jesus of the Bible is. See, we must come to God on his terms and not on our terms. You know, there's a lot of distorted views of who Jesus is, and I'm going to give you a few of them. And I'm not being political. Please don't send me emails saying um, this or that. Let me tell you, Jesus is not political. He is about the kingdom of God. But first of all, Jesus is not the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant that we see in many movies. Oh, you know, you look at Jesus, and even on the, the Son of God movie, you know, a white Anglo-Saxon, that, that he must be a middle class. That sounds good in America. You know, that we say, man, Jesus had it easy, and, and that he was, you know, wealthy. And had, no, Jesus was not wealthy in the things of this world. He didn't even have a place to call his own. He didn't have a bed to lay on. He didn't come from a middle class home. He didn't have the, the newest fad and the newest guy. He, didn't, he was traveling with misfit disciples, and, and he and he struggled and he was contrary to the world of that day. He wasn't a white Anglo-Saxon. I'm thankful that Jesus is for whosoever wills. Another distorted view of Jesus is that he is not the Republican conservative Jesus. Oh. Jesus was not of any political party. He was not Republican, Democrat, Tea Party, or Libertarian. He came to build the kingdom of God, and, and he wasn't a Republican. He wasn't a Democrat. He was not the mascot or, or, or a spokesman for any political party. He was involved with the issues of his day, He's coming to seek and to save them that were lost. So he wasn't this, you know, conservative Republican. He wasn't also, uh, 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 Jesus didn't come to build a political kingdom, but to build a spiritual kingdom. And God understood that governments could never change the the heart of a person. We can have rules and regulations and boundaries, but Jesus came not with a political mandate, but with a spiritual mandate that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And the good news is there's going to be Republicans in heaven. There's going to be Democrats in heaven. There's going to be Tea Party people in heaven. There's going to be whosoever wills in heaven. Reality, the reality is the greatest hope of America is not a new president or a new mayor or a new government. But God's people that are so on fire for Jesus Christ. It says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will come, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. See, when God looked at the world, he saw the condition, and he didn't send Jesus as a king. He sent him as a newborn babe, and he grew, and he walked on this earth for 33 years, then he hung on an old rugged tree. He said, I'm coming back as a king, but he gave his son, he gave the church, and and God gave us his one and only son to save the world from their sin. Another distorted view is that he is a social activist, Jesus. And everybody today is into social justice. And I thank God that Christians in the church need to be more involved in social justice and abortion and, uh, and, you know, and standing against it and standing against human trafficking and, and alcoholism and drug addiction and gun control, all, all that stuff. Jesus came to feed the hungry and to heal the sick and to minister to people who are down and out. And, and we, we need to meet the needs of people. But that's not the end of it, not just giving them and meeting their needs. See, 
Jesus not only helped people socially, but he gave them spiritual and eternal hope. He not only fed the hungry, but he gave them the bread of life. He not only gave them water to drink, but he gave them the water that will never grow thirsty again. He not only healed their physical bodies, but he healed them spiritually. I'm so thankful that Jesus cares about social issues, but he not only came to give us help, but he came to give us hope as well. Buster Sores in his book says it this way, Jesus came to bring more than just help. He came to bring hope. In the world today, if you just give someone in desperate need help, they still may be depressed and commit suicide. But if you bring them hope, however, they will probably learn how to get their own help. Then both needs will be met. Oh, another view of Jesus is that he's the passive Jesus. If you look at most of the pictures that are sold in Bible bookstores, and, and probably if you have pictures in your Bible, we have the nice passive Jesus, uh, the good shepherd, the nice mild-mannered lamb of God, holding a nice little lamb. And, and we have this idea that Jesus is some kind of soft and, and would never hurt a flea, and he's easygoing, and nothing could ruffle him, and, and he would never get angry, he'd never get upset. He was nice to everyone and he was always sweet. We like that picture of Jesus, but it's not reality. Philip Yancey said this about the picture of Jesus. The personality of that emerges from the Gospels differs from radically from the image that most churches give. An image I now recognize is some older Hollywood movies about Jesus. In those movies, Jesus recites his lines without emotion. He strides through life as the one calm character among a cast of fluttered extras. Nothing ever rattles Jesus. He dispenses wisdom in a flat, measured tone. He is, in short, a Prozac Jesus. It says, in contrast, the Bible presents a man who has such charisma that people would sit for three days and listen to him without even having food. He went on to say that he seems excitable, moved with compassion, and filled with pity. The Gospels reveal a range of Jesus' emotional responses, sudden a, a, a sympathy of a person with leprosy, exuberance over a success of a disciple, a blast of anger, a cold-hearted legalist, grief over an unre, un, unrepentant city, and then those awful cries of anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane as, as he prayed, Lord, not my cup, but thy, thy will be done. Uh, uh, we, we think of the cross. He had nearly inexhaustible patience with sinners, but he had no patience at all with institutions and injustice. See, Jesus was not some wimpy little Jesus. He was a loving God, but he's coming as a mighty Savior one day. He's not the icon Jesus. You know, icons and idol. you know, how many people carry a memento of Jesus and we worship some object that represents Jesus to them and, and maybe it's a crucifix, maybe it's a rosary, maybe it's a cross, maybe it's a WWJD bracelet, uh, maybe it's, you know, a healing water from the Jordan or, or it's some kind of memento. Uh, and you know, there's nothing wrong with mementos, but let me give you the truth this morning. My Jesus is more than an idol. My Jesus is more than an icon. My Jesus is more than a cross. My Jesus is my Savior. My Jesus is my friend. My Jesus is the one who walks and talks with me and tells me that I am his own. He is a real person and he's more than an idol. He's more than American idol. He's my personal Lord and Savior. Another distorted view is that he is just a good teacher, a prophet, as we heard on the video. We live in a day when this world wants to lump Jesus in with Muhammad and the prophet and Dalai Lama and religious figures. And they're all good teachers and it doesn't matter how we get to God. That sounds good, but it's a distorted view of who Jesus is. It says in John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life says in John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And Jesus wants to be more uh, than, than an image. He wants to be more than, than a Republican or a Democrat or a government. He wants to be more than the passive Jesus. But God created us for relationships. And, and we see that all the way back in the, in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis when, when Adam was alone and Adam and, and God would walk along and, and God saw that Adam was alone. And he says, I, I, I will make a 
woman for you. I help me to be with you. And, and, and even that, he walked with them at the cool of the day. And we know the story. That serpent came and tempted her with the, with the fruit on the tree. And she took it and she gave it to Adam. And he ate and she ate. And sin came into the world. And, and God still came looking after them because he wanted relationship with them. He didn't give up on them. He could have said, I'm going to start all over again. But he went looking for them. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? He was always calling out. He was looking for him. And God wants relationship with you and with me as well. See, God created us for intimacy. Rod Cooper, not the singer, the counselor said this. Intimacy is into me see. Intimacy is when someone can look inside of you. I'm so thankful that there are people in my life that can see into me. I, I, I need people to look into me. I, 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 I'm thankful that God looks into me. And, and when he sees, he doesn't walk away. Friendship is not an option, but it's a real need. You know, we live in a day when people have Facebook friends, but we have no real friends. We are more connected than we've ever been, but we have no companionship. We try to fill our lives with more gadgets and more, more, more uh, 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 games and more stuff and more pleasure and more drugs and cutting and on and on and on it goes because we're desperate for someone to have intimacy with us. And, and I'm so glad that Jesus came not to just to be a religious figure, but he came to have intimacy with us and he wants to do life with us and he is a real friend this morning. What are some characteristics of a real friend? Number one, a real friend always loves you. Always loves you. It says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. See, a real friend loves you when things are good and when things are bad. They love you when you're there, and they love you when you're not. They love you when you're together. They love you when you're not there. You can count on them when you're down and out. Jesus is that real friend who will always love you. You can count on Jesus no matter where you are, what you've done, no matter how far you've fallen from him. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. God is not the mean God in heaven who is looking down saying, I'm, when they mess up, I'm going to zap them. I, I'm going to kill them. No, Jesus says, I love you. I love you when you're serving me. I loved you before you're serving me. He loves your unsaved loved ones today. He loves your unsaved mate. He loves your unsaved children. He goes after them. He loves them with an unending love. It says in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than that he laid down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for me. I was, I was a sinner, but he called me a friend when I wasn't even close to him. He laid down his life for his his friends. He loved me when I'm a sinner. How much more does he love me now? A real friend, number two, will always stick by you. You can tell your friends when you go through a difficult thing. It says in Proverbs 18, 24, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We live in a world today when the home is so dysfunctional. Parents and children are broken and dysfunction and there's no real relationships and absentee dads and kids that are, that are raised in the system and, and, they, and they don't have a father, they don't have a mother, they're, they're parents and, and they don't know and, and there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm so thankful that Jesus sticks with you. I am thankful for some good friends that I have in my life. And when I'm doing great, they're there. When I'm not doing great, they're still there. They have stood by me in my difficult hours, in my dark days. And, and I have a handful of friends that, that I can call and trust in and, and know that what I say stays there. And they love me. They don't judge me. They don't criticize me. They don't gossip about me. But that, that is a wonderful description of Jesus. That, that when I feel that everybody else has left me, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That even my mother and father may forsake me. He will never, ever forsake me. He's always there. He's going to stick to you. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, I 
I will never, ever, 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 ever leave you nor forsake you. Jesus didn't leave his disciples when they messed up. I think of Judas when he sold them out for 30 pieces of silver and you know, when Jesus knew what he was going to do, and yet when, when he was at that, at that, in the garden, when the soldiers came, and he allowed Judas to kiss them on the cheek, I don't know if I would do that. I'd probably want to cold cock him one. Uh, you know, you just sold me out for 30 pieces of silver, uh, and, and, and now I'm going to let you kiss me. But yet Jesus allowed Judas to come up, and, 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 and he didn't forsake him. I think of Peter when he denounced him three times, and, and he says, Peter, before the crow crawls three times. You're going to deny me three times. Oh, no, not me, Lord. But Jesus knew what he was going to do, and yet he still embraced them and loved them. And when they didn't have faith and they doubted, he went out on the storm and the waves, and he got, walked on the waves, and, and when he got into the boat, he, he rebuked the wind and the waves. He didn't rebuke his disciple. He didn't throw them overboard. He said, I will not forsake you. Jesus stood by them. And I'm so glad that Jesus stands by us today. That when we confess our sins, I want to let you know that you will blow it. We all fail. But I'm so glad that I have good news that Jesus is always going to be there. And even when Peter began to sink in the water, Jesus reached down his hand and grabbed the hold of it. And when we're going down, if we will reach out to Jesus, Jesus will be there to reach out to us. Another quality of a real friend that I see in Jesus is a real friend will tell you the truth. See, a real friend loves you enough to tell the truth because they have a relationship with you. We have a lot of people that want to supposedly tell you the truth but have no relationship with you. But a real friend has a relationship with you and they can speak into your life not to kick you but to help you. They'll not say one thing to your face and another thing behind your back. But they care enough to tell you the truth because they see something in your life. And it says in Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Jesus is a friend that will speak the truth into our lives. I want you to turn me to John chapter 15 and... You know, sometimes we don't want, we want a Jesus that is the passive Jesus that will just pat us on the back and say, anything will go and, and whatever you want to do, it's okay. But Jesus is a friend that is full of grace and full of truth. It says in John 15, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off, well, we don't like that, that's painful. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He, Jesus told them the truth. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, that's the truth. You are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that your, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Look at verse 13. Greater love, greater love, greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friend. There's not a period there. It says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. But instead, I have called you friends. Wow. Too many Christians walk around like a slave. A servant. Jesus broke the chains. If I'm a servant, I obey because I have to. 
But a friend obeys because of the relationship. A husband and wife, if it's just a, if it's just a, 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 a relationship, there's no intimacy. It's, it's just duty. Jesus says, I don't want you serving me out of duty. I no longer call you a servant. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. Hit verse 16. You did not choose me. But I chose you. I chose you. I chose you. I remember middle school. I wasn't too athletic in middle school. I thought I was kind of husky. And I always hated at recess when they picked teams. I want you. I'll take you. I'll take you. I'll take you. You're standing there saying, please, somebody pick me. <laughs> you know, you try to get their attention. <laughs> I'm here. And when you get down to the last one, you take them. <laughs> I'm so glad, God doesn't pick everybody else. He says, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. I want you. I love you. I care about you. I want you on my team. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give it to you. Jesus is a real friend. He's full of grace and truth and will tell the story to us. Uh, quickly, number four, a real friend will encourage you. A real friend picks you up, lifts you up, is there, believes in you, and helps lift you to a place you don't think you can go yourself. Uh, in the Lion King, the father lion, Mufasa, says to Simba, his son, you are more than what you have become. And I'm so glad that God is going to make us more than we could ever come by, by ourselves. And, and I'm so glad, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to do you good and not harm, to give you a hope and to give you a future. Jesus takes me out of the pit of sin and he puts his call upon my life and he works with me. And if you will follow me, I will bless you. If you will give me your life. I will give you a divine purpose and a divine potential. That is why Jesus is my friend. He lifts me up. Another characteristic of a real friend, he's interested in what interests you. It says in Proverbs 18, 24, a man that has friends must show himself friendly and there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. How many have ever had to do something for someone you really didn't want to do? You know, Em and I have a lot of likes, but one time she asked me to go see the Nutcracker. <laughs> the Nutcracker. Can't we go anywhere else? No, I want to see the Nutcracker. Three hours of it. Is there an intermission so I can get popcorn and a Diet Coke? No. The only reason I would endure <laughs> is because my wife wanted me to go. Anybody else ask me to go? Forget it. There's a lot of... I won't go. See, Jesus is concerned with what concerns me. He's touched with the feelings of my infirmities. 
He knows your issues. He, 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 with the fisherman, he went fishing. With the tax collector, it was money. With the woman at the well, it was living water. Jesus is a real friend because he's concerned about the things that concern you. For those who have lost loved ones, he's concerned about your sorrow. Uh, for those, uh, for that little uh, 10-year-old girl uh, that has cancer, he's concerned about that family today. Uh, for that one that received the phone call about drugs, uh, uh, you know, God's concerned about you. For those that have unsaved husbands or wives or children. God's concerned about that. He's concerned about everything that touches your life. He's not like me going to the nutcrackers. Oh, I have to endure this. I have to endure. No, Jesus is there. He wraps your arms of love around you. He'll walk with you. He'll talk with you. He will bring with you through the dark and through the lonely and through the heartache of life. And lastly, as the music begins to play, a real friend operates on your schedule when you have a need. Jesus doesn't work nine to five. Well, oh, Pastor, I tried calling you. The office was closed. I'm not God. No pastor is God. But Jesus is on call 24-7, 365. He's there in the midnight hour. He's there when the hospital calls. He's there wherever you are. It says in Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinners, when we needed him the most, Christ died for me. He's waiting for us to invite him in. He made himself available to me. He's available today. He's going to be available tomorrow. He's going to be available when my, my world falls apart because I behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man comes and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him. He is always available and a real friend is not just talk but he walks through life with us